We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. So they lead o the cold dark mountain, seeking his sheep. Or along by Salome's fountains, helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus that made the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. By and by through the shining portals, turning our feet. We shall walk with the glad immortals at Golden Street. Footprints of Jesus that made the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. Next hymn, hymn number 614, 614. We have an anchor. <clears throat> Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides sleep and the cables strain, Will your anchor drift for firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps us so Steadfast and sure will the billows roll Fasten to the rock which cannot move Ground the firm and deep in the Saviour's love it is safely more to the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Saviour's hand. And the cables pass from his heart to mine, can defy the blast through strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul Step fast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move. Ground the firm and deep in the Saviour's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbour bright. We shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore with the storms of us forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fasten to the rock which cannot move. Ground up a man deep in the Saviour's love. One more hymn before the opening prayer by Brother Kelvin. Hymn number 94. Each step I take. Hymn number 94. We'll sing all three stanzas. Each step I take, my Saviour goes before me. And with His loving hand, he leads the way, and with his breath, I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, what joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, I know that he will guide me to higher ground. He ever leads me on until someday. The last step will be taken, each step I take, 
just leads me closer home. At times I feel my faith begin to waver. When up ahead I see a chasm wide, is then I turn and look up to my Savior. I am strong when He is by my side. Each step I take, I know that He will guide me to higher ground. He never leads me on until someday the last step will be taken. Each step I take just leads me closer home. I trust in God, no matter come what me, for life eternal is in His hand. He holds the key that opens up the way that will lead me to the promised land. Each step I take, I know the King will guide me to higher ground. He never leads me on until someday. The last step will be taken. Each step I take just leads me closer home. Shall we all rise for the opening prayer? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we come here to joy and bless in it, Father, to come before you in prayer, to come before the most holy throne, the most awesome presence as, as we bring forth our petition and our request to you, but most importantly, our worship and honor to you. Father, as we continue to live our lives on this earth, as not only sojourners, as not, not only humans on this earth, but as Christians, as your children, that we continue to shine our light to the people around us and not just that, Father, to preach and to share your word and your will to, to the people that is around us. On, for it is your to, to, to share to them that you, O oh Lord, love, love them so much. And it's, it is you who want, if it's die, we want them to be safe and to, to, and to be able to, to meet these people in, to meet these people and acknowledge you as your, you as their Lord and their Savior. Father, this time we are so grateful that we're able to gather here in this church premise, both physically and virtually, as we're about to continue our third part on the book and the, the theme on the Be Attitudes, as we are about to hear from our from Brother Jonah that you continue to that you be with him as she shared to us on the the third part, blesses are the meek, that you may grant him the bonus of speech and clarity of speech as she shared to us his lesson from your word this evening. Father, be with us listeners who are tuning in virtually as well as here physically, that we continue, we ask for a heart of openness as well as a heart of, and a, mind, a focused mind as we hear uh, Father Jonah's lesson this evening. Father, this is hum, this is our humble prayer, or this thing we pray in the Psalm's precious name and our Lord. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Indeed, a uh, privilege to be back here on a, on a Wednesday evening to share with you on the third part of the, the Beatitudes, which is Blessed of the Meek. And as the Calvin has just mentioned, we are on a series uh, on the Beatitudes. 
and we have recently listened to two uh, lessons that were taught by the Kai and by Adrian, respectively, on the poor in spirit, and blessed are they that mourn. And before we go into the lesson, or various slides. Let's look at the full part of this verse, which is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Er, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's get the icon set up first. So this was in Matthew 5, verse 5. And it says here, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And these and the Beatitudes always had, had two parts to it. First is the blessing upon the, uh, the, the recipient of blessing, and then the effect of that blessing. So in this purpose, in this case, in 5 verse 5, the recipient of the blessing are the meek. And the product of that blessing is that they shall then inherit the earth. But before we go into the blessed, uh, the, the Beatitudes proper, I think it's good for us to re-examine on what did Jesus provide us the Beatitudes. Now, if you look at the entire series of Beatitudes from uh, Matthew 3, verse, sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 12, you can see that it all follows the same pattern, right? The same pattern of a, a blessing, a receiver, and then the reward in that sense, or the... Or the Phone. Yeah, and the recipient of the blessing and then the effect on that person. And if you look at the Beatitudes itself, it, the, the recipient and the reward are often contradictory. For you don't usually find these two things happening uh, together in a normal point of view. Like for example, from a point of view of the world, a person who inherits the earth, or in the sense of person who inherits the earth as the world knows it, means they gain riches, they gain fame, is not someone who is meek. If you look at the entirety of uh, the richest people in the world, neither of these people can be said to be meek people. And the rich, current richest man in the world, Elon Musk, is definitely a very, very, very far away from being a meek man. So the world, in that sense, defines the reward that, this, uh, that Jesus has given us in the Beatitudes very differently, in a way that is almost contradictory or opposite, total and total opposite to what Jesus is telling us. And that is in fact the reason why Jesus gave the Beatitudes, which to provide a alternative or to provide a new understanding of what it is, of the rewards that he wants to give us and the things that Jesus has come to, uh, to fulfill and to, to turn things around his head, right? To provide, to turn people's thinking around on, on worldly, worldly pleasures compared to heavenly pleasures, right? Because until, until then, the Jewish community and the people around them were very focused on worldly blessings. If you look at the patriarchs and the, the entirety of the Old Testament, uh, blessings always came together with material wealth. Like when you talked about Abraham, talk talked about David, talk about Solomon, all their blessings, although they also came with uh, wisdom and other and, and godly blessings, but also there was always a wealth component to it. So in that sense, the Jews were always were, were very, or the people at the time of Israelites were very used to looking at blessings with a material or wealth component to it. And Jesus comes now and talks about and talks about beatitudes, or a totally different thing than what they have been used to hearing. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to tell us in the Beatitudes: that what he has come to bless us with, what he has come to give to this world, the gift that he has come to provide to this world, has nothing to do with earthly pleasures, but rather with spiritual pleasures. Now let's go into uh, the, the verse itself, Matthew 5, verse 5, blessed are uh, the meek. So what is meek? What's the, what's the definition of meek? Uh, the meek in the Greek word is praus, and that is uh, mild, and that is by implication, humble. And it is a very interesting word to, to consider, because uh, not many of us uh, use this word in our daily lives, usually. You hardly go around and saying uh, that's a very meek person, uh, or that's a very uh, use the word humble a lot, but the word meek uh, is something that is hardly used. But 
the definition of humble and meek can use, are usually used interchangeably within the, the, the Bible itself, especially within the King James Version, the New King James Version. Uh, the word meek and humble is used interchangeably. But that the word meek itself has the definition or the or the or the inclination of that inclination of a mild person, someone who is lowly, someone who is so to anger, so to wrath, and person that is or generally not confrontational. But let's just think for a moment, like I'm going to be pausing through this lesson a bit frequently. But let's think a moment that do you know someone in your life who is meek? So anyone who thinks that they know someone in their life who is a meek person or you consider a meek person, you know, you can raise your hands if you think so that you, you met someone who is meek. Adrian says he knows someone that is meek. That's great. So it's the poaching. So I mean, we have a lot of people, we, de we define meek differently. Now, the second question is, do you consider yourself a meek person? Do we consider ourselves meek? And usually the answer is, you know, uh, no, right? Because a lot of us don't consider ourselves very meek people. I mean, we are people of the world. We grew up within the, the reins of our society, within the confined society. And uh, we seek after things, right? We, 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 there, there, are, there are a few things that in life that we, that we like and the few things that, that in life that we are good at, we excel at. And we want to tell the world about it. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But let's today, what we're going to do is we're going to look what exactly does Jesus say here by me? What does it mean by someone who is meek? And what is the what are the implications of such a person? And we're going to, we're going to be actually looking at uh, a parallel verse, a parallel verse that we that most scholars believe that Jesus based uh, uh, his beatitudes on, which is Psalms chapter 37, verse 1 to 11, especially this this part. And, so the Psalm of David, Psalm 37, verse 1 to 11. We read here that it says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease but anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. So in this Psalm 37 verses 1 to 11, David here is, is painting a picture of someone who is meek, as we see in the ends in uh, 37 verse 11. And the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in abundance of peace. And evil doers shall be cut off. And those, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. So in his Beatitudes, Jesus was directly meant making a reference to the Psalm of, uh, of David. Or in that sense, Jesus was the one who wrote the Psalm of David because a lot of we believe all, all scripture is by the Lord. So essentially, Jesus was foreshadowing his Beatitudes through David in, that, in this Psalm. And then in this Psalm, you read of a image or a reflection of someone who is me. And what he does to prevent himself or to, or to prevent himself from being a strung up and high up person. And we look and we're going to look at uh, some of the qualities of a meek person as David has provided us here today. And we're seeing how we can uh, use this in our lives. So the first thing that we're going to look at is in Psalm 37, verse 3, that a meek person trusts in the Lord. So trust in the Lord and do good. So thou shalt, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. The, meek, the beginning of meekness is the trust in the Lord. And in Proverbs 3, verse 5, written by uh, his forebearer, Solomon, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on to thy own understanding. So the beginning of meekness is trust in the Lord. And what trust are we talking about here? We're not talking about the trust you have in a in a in a 
absolute being or a or equation to work. You know, you're not you're not talking about when you pump a petrol in your car, you trust your car to move, right? Talking about an absolute trust. A trust in the Lord that comprises of all our heart. And we see that in Spiritual 3, verse 5, that we when you trust in the Lord, we lean not on our own understanding. It means that we give all our thoughts, all our life, all our understanding to God. We trust him because he created us and not we ourselves. He, he, he is the one who made us, and that is actually the other part of the preceding parts of uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 onwards, 6, 7, 8. For we are his sheep, and the, we are the creation and the sheep of his pasture. Like how a, shep, a, a sheep trusts a shepherd, so how so that way should we also be trusting the Lord? And we cannot start, we cannot begin our journey of meekness before without acknowledging that layer of trust, right? The first establishing that layer of trust between us and God. And that comprises of a lot, a lot of effort. It's not something that, you know, uh, you just wake up one day and decide, like, I'm going to trust in the Lord. No, it's not, it's not a process. It's not a, 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 a one-off decision that you make. It, it involves a lot of communication, a lot of understanding, a lot of reading, a lot of examples and a lot of uh, interaction with our brethren, interaction with the word, interaction with saints to fully build that trust in the Lord. Although by definition, the trust of the Lord is a absolute thing, right? It's not something that we ought to be saying that uh, today I trust the Lord 50%, tomorrow I trust the Lord 60%, then the day after I trust the Lord 100%. Although it is a process that we have to build, uh, uh, a Understanding we have to get before we actually before we actually step into the kingdom of heaven, before we actually decide to get baptized. At the point of baptism, that is when we decide that we are going to trust in the Lord at our full being every day of our lives. And it's not an option that we get. It's not an option that, that Jesus has provided or the God or God has provided to us that you can trust me at different points, at, at different levels throughout your life, and that's fine. That's not what God said. God tells us that we have to trust in Him every day of our lives and with every and every fiber of our being and then only can we be can we dwell in the land and then only can we barely can we be fed and this is god's way of telling us that if you trust in me there's nothing that you have to want for there's nothing you have to worry about it's like let me read in Matthew 6 3 right seek first the kingdom of god his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you so in that sense the beginning of meekness is the trust in the lord now look at the next one, the next verse. You can look at it uh, sequentially. Psalm 37 verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37 verse 4. To be meek is to find unparalleled joy in the Lord's work, or to find unparalleled joy in being within the kingdom of heaven, or being within the saints. Now, I'm going to ask a very quick question. What makes you happy? Let's think about it for a moment. What makes us happy? Is that is it a, a good meal you get to eat uh, uh, every day? Or the, or the fact that you know you have a nice car to drive, or you have this, this new game come out and just and you're so excited to play it? Or, you know, or is it your husband? Is it your wife? Is it your boyfriend, your girlfriend? What makes you happy? And, and when you close your eyes and you think of like uh, after a long day of work, you know, after a, 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 a bad day, what do you do to make yourself happy? And that's your answer to what makes you happy, right? For most people, after a long day of work, if you're single, maybe you can look out for watching a good movie. If you're married with your relationship, maybe you look to the comfort of your spouse on your other half. How often do we then, uh, after a long day of work, when you're feeling down, you're feeling sad, do we look towards God as our joy, as our source of joy? I myself can say that I, do, I hardly do that, right? It's only when you're in the depths of despair, sometimes, most of the time, that you decide, you know, well, there's nowhere else to turn to, then you look towards the God for comfort, right? But how often is it that when we, when we, we go through something bad, the first thing we, we think of is God? Usually that doesn't really happen. So the question is, how do we then begin this process of finding joy in the Lord? And the question is, of course, you have to start with, the answer is, of course, you have to start with first trusting the Lord. That's what we said in the previous. But it's, and it's teaching in Psalm 100, verse 1 to 2, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And the answer is right there. Serve the Lord and come to his presence. The serving of the Lord and the doing of his word is the one that will 
be able to give us joy. And to be meek, right, where we understand to be humble, is to understand that it is through this true God that we can get this joy. It's not through the other things I've just mentioned, the other things that we often look after, often look for to bring joy in our lives, but it is through the Lord's work. It's to understanding that doing something greater than what was given to us, the, the execution of a work that is greater than what we are, bigger than who we are, and extends beyond even beyond our life and even beyond our, our being, is the one that is going to give us the unparalleled joy that we need to stay or, or to be a meek person. Because otherwise, we'll be attributing our joy to a physical being, or we're attributing our joy to a material thing. Like, for example, if I attribute my joy to my PS5, then that PS5 is control of my life. If I attribute my joy to my, my friend or my outing, that, that outing is the one controlling my life. I'm looking forward to that outing. I'm looking forward to go home and playing my PS5. I'm not looking forward to doing the Lord's work because I do not, I do not put my joy in the Lord's work. And that is why it's so important for us to change our mind or to, com or to convince ourselves to uh, for us understand that it is through the Lord that we are able to get the highest amount of joy. And that is uh, the second, the, as David has said here, the second way, second step for us to become meek people, to understand that our joy is within the Lord and not within material possessions. Now, the third thing we'll look at is commit thy ways to the Lord. And 37 verses 5 to 6 it says here, Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, as the judgment, as the noonday. In Psalm 37 verse 5 to 6. In Proverbs 3 verse 6, which is the next part of the verse, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. The third part, the third step of being meek, right? So we trust the Lord. After we, we put our joy in the Lord, is that we commit our ways to the Lord. We commit everything that we do we submit our plans for his approval. Now, the word commit is very interesting, right? Uh, in, in the digital scene or in the tech scene, we use the word commit a lot. We use it in the sense that we are going to commit a code to a branch. Or we're going to commit a code to a, uh, a, represent, uh, a repo, or what we call represent, re, re, pre, okay, I, can't, I can't pronounce the word, but a repo. Yeah, and this is where we store all our code. And when you, once, when you commit a code to a repo, that means that code is ready to be executed. It's going to be, it's ready to be tested. We do, we, we, do not, we do not commit unfinished code to the repo or to the branch because that will mess up the entire system. We always commit codes that we are ready to be reviewed or codes that we are, we are confident that we can work to the, the branch that's going to be, uh, to the branch in that sense. So in that sense, when you say committing our ways a lot, it doesn't mean that we just go there and, and, and you know, tell God that this is what we're going to do, right? We are, we are telling God plans that we know it's, going to be, that we know, that we want to be approved by him. Not only giving plans that we know that are going to be approved by him, right? We have to, we have to be committing plans or committing our lives in a manner that God will approve. And not just today, uh, we, like, to, like tomorrow I want to go and uh, uh, go fishing on a Sunday and I pray to God, please give me good weather on Sunday so I can go fishing, right? That's not committing, even though that's including God in that decision, that's not committing what we want to the Lord. So that goes against what the Lord wants us to do. Because the Lord says on Sundays, uh, we come to church and we gather with the saints, not that we go out and do whatever we want to do, right? So in that sense, the word commit is very powerful. It means that we are, we are acknowledging that God is our approver. He's approving our work. He's approving what we're going to do. And we, are, and we want to commit work to him that he's going to approve, that he will find uh, acceptable and right in his sight. We don't want to be committing things that he does not approve. Because then... It's, it's, it's in vain. We're not, we're, not, we're not acknowledging him. We're not allowing him to direct our paths. And that is the power of the word commit. And a lot of times we, I feel that maybe you use the word, uh, commit the word, everything to the Lord in a, in a very loose manner. Right? Everything we do, commit a lot, commit a lot. But then we have to we have to take one step back and ask ourselves, are we committing the right things to God? Is he even, does he even want to acknowledge what we are doing? And are we doing are we making sure that we're taking the right boxes? Are we rechecking our code in that sense? Are we reviewing our code? Are we re reviewing our lifestyle? Are we re reviewing our plans? And is God in that plan? Is God the forefront in that plan? And if it's not, then it's time for us to start committing our lives to Him and start committing our lifestyle to God in a way that He will approve of it and not in a way that we think is right for us, rather in a way that God thinks is right for us. And that is the third way of being meek. 
because the, the process of being meek, the process of being a humble person, always starts, I mentioned, always has this very core part of God in it. To understand that it is not us that is in control. It is God that wants to control us. Well, not that they came around, but it's God that wants to be in control of our lives, to guide us to the right path. And not so much of we being in control of our lives to do whatever we want to do. So that is the third step of being a meek person. And the fourth thing to look at, just the second part of the preceding verse, the proceeding verse, is rest in the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patient for him. And wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospered in his ways, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. In Psalm 37 verse 7. In Psalm 22 verse 14, we see a similar uh, verse here. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So now, it is, let's just go back to the process, right, what we've just learned. First, we have to trust in the Lord. We have to find joy in what we are doing, find the joy in the trust that we give to the Lord. And then we have to commit our works to God. And, find, and after that, once we've committed everything, we commit our plans to Him, we wait patiently. We wait. A lot of times, uh, the a, a characteristic of a highly successful individual is they are a hustler, right? So the way the world looks at it. You're a hustler, you're moving things fast, you're getting, getting results fast, you're getting... Uh, your money in the past, you're trading on, uh, on crypto. You know, today you went up 10%, you, you, you earn a, a billion ringgit. Well, good on you. The world, the world these days and the world for the past how many years, I don't know, once things pass, what we call instant gratification. We want our likes on Instagram to come within, within two days. We want uh, everything to happen within, the, within a, a period of 24 hours. We want to see our results as soon as we put in, we put in our, our requests. And that's how the world has, uh, has progressed. And recently I've heard this quote. Uh, I, I read this quote with my friend on Instagram, and the quote was, how is it that we are getting busier even though the world is getting more and more convenient? If you think about it, the world has, com has, became, has become more and more convenient over the past 2,000 years, but yet we are getting busier. Although the world is getting easier, the, the people are making things easier for us to do things, but yet, we are getting busier. For some reason, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are getting busier than trying to get and trying to work our lives. And that is exactly what, 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 what the world has become. And it's exactly in, in, uh, in contrast to what this verse says. Because the person who is meek waits for the Lord. He puts his trust in the Lord and he isn't anxious for things to happen. He trusts in Lord's plan. He trusts that God has a plan out there. And, and because he has committed his plans to the Lord in a manner that God will approve, he trusts in the process. He trusts that God is strong on his promise, that God will reward those who diligently wait for him, who diligently seek him. And that is something I think we all need to learn to do, especially uh, as, as all of us who live in a very high paid society, especially myself as well. If when you live in a startup, uh, in a, in a startup, in a startup environment, things are changing rapidly. Right? Today, today uh, we are planning to do this, tomorrow, we have, we, have, we have totally changed our, 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 our game plan and we're go, and going to a, a new direction. And that's very, very common in the startup industry. So in the startup industry, we hardly will wait for things to happen. We need to get things done fast. But that is in contrast to what God wants us to live our lives. And for us to reach that level of, being anxious, of not being anxious or letting God run his plans comes only if you are able to do the first three things. So these things all, it, it's not like we can choose one and do the rest later. It has to come in sequence. Only if we are committed our lives in the right manner to the Lord are we then able to sit back and wait patiently for Him because we know that we are living our lives in accordance to the will that is given, according to the commandments that is given to us. That is number four, rest in the Lord. And finally, cease from anger and forsake wrath, fret, not thyself in any wise do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off, and those shall wait. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And from 8 to 11, uh, David then proceeds to talk about how we then trust in the Lord and how, we, how evil doers will then have their, will have their uh, up upcomings in God's time. So number five is that once you've done all these, once you're waiting patiently, you will be at peace. And a person at peace, the person who is not anxious, a person who is not looking to be the opposite of being meek, 
right? It's not looking at a person who has peace is not looking to to shout his name on the rooftop. It's not he's not looking to to be the the greatest person ever lived. He is at peace. And you look at the world around us, right? Even though we after you're committing the word, after we have uh, uh, waiting on the Lord, it's easy for us to get distracted because evil abounds. And uh, Daniel once asked me this question that uh, you know everybody, everybody. No, sorry, even the evil people of this world, people who are not who are not who are not following God's word, right, are still getting blessed. They are still gaining riches. They are, yeah, they are, they are getting so many good things in life, right? For from what you know, the world views. So what exactly then is a blessing in the sense of the word and what blessing that God wants to give us? And that and the answer I gave him is exactly what I'm telling you is the is the the blessing of peace, the blessing of meekness. And it's something that it cannot be cannot be taught. It cannot be learned in the secular world. If you go out, you go outside there, you can easily go for a, a course on how to make money. You can easily go for a course on how to be more on, on leadership. How to can be how to increase your public speaking. How can you increase your your confidence? How can you increase your people skills? Right. There's so many courses out there. I've, I've, I myself have gone gone over so many, but there are very very obviously there's close to none courses that are going to teach you how to be a patient person, how to be a more loving person. How are you gonna be a more humble person? Right? Nobody, nobody, nobody wants to sell you a, a, a course that's gonna teach you how to be humble because that's not gonna earn them money. That's not, gonna, that's, gonna, that's not gonna earn you money. The world focuses on these things, but yet these are not the things that's gonna make us better people. It's not the people, these are not things that are gonna make us better uh, humans, better Christians, and better, better friends in that sense. It is the things that God wants to give us, the beatitudes that He has shown us, the fruits of the Spirit that He has provided to us. That, that God wants that God wants to give us, and that is what the blessings of Christianity and the blessings of God can flow through. Because it is only in the church, it's only within the, the confines of the Christian world, within the confines of the Bible, are we able to build these things up. Because when well, we trust in the Lord, when we are meek, the events of the world don't fail us. Like all these things, they come and they go. The wars, they come and they go. The the price increases, you know, um, uh, the Tafan being. Seven ringgit today, ten ringgit tomorrow. Well, it's also just part of life. And the end, if you are live, if you are, if you are living life according to the pattern that God has given to us, then we are truly be able to say that we shall inherit the earth. Because if we look at Matthew seven six twenty three, you look at the entirety of this uh, of uh, the these few verses in Psalm say seven. That's all they will say that we will enjoy life. We we'll enjoy life not as the world enjoys it, but enjoy it through an, a calm, a full and calming peace that comes upon us and that, not, that the world cannot shake. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus has overcome the world. So, if it, and we'll go into a bit, uh, just a bit, uh, very very briefly on uh, on inheriting the earth and what exactly does it mean later because it's in the, uh, in the preceding verses we have to speak mainly gone through it quite a bit but let's just run through the the five steps right that uh, we have just been explained just now on the path to being a meek person first we trust in the Lord all our heart we have to, excuse me a decision that we have to make second we have to find joy in the Lord find joy in His work third we commit our works to his to him to acknowledge. And that means that we don't just commit any anything out there. We commit something that he wants to approve. What we rest. We are patient. We sit down and we believe and we trust in the Lord to execute his will. And fourth, sorry, and fifth, once all this is done, you'll be at peace. And once we have peace, we will definitely be the meekest people that you'll find on earth. But now let's just talk about. Look at uh, on, on one person. We're not going to look at this very, very deeply as well. But we're going to look at one person who was called the meekest man on earth. And, and anybody wants to guess who this person is? No, we don't know who the meekest man on earth is. Alvin says the answer. Oh yeah, Alvin says Moses, and Alvin is completely correct because this happened in Numbers chapter twelve, verse three. Now, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than any person in the face of the earth, written by Moses. <laughs> and 
and this is a popular internet meme that has uh, that has been going on on the Christian meme sites. But okay, it's just in jest because you all know that 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 uh, <laughs> that God inspired uh, Moses to write that, and, and essentially God was the one who is saying that. But it is the, in Numbers chapter twelve, verse three. They said that Moses was a very humble man, and at that point in time, he was the most humble man of the face of the earth. Now, the, the preceding verses that came before that is uh, talking about how Aaron and Miriam, because uh, we had a discontentment with, I was discontented with Moses because he had taken a Ethiopian woman as his wife. And God, and they were, they were just, they were just uh, being very discontented at Moses. And God then called them into the tabernacle and they reprimanded both of them for, being, for, for, for their actions and for their behavior. And the, the Bible specifically, specifically said that Moses was meek at that point because in, in the entire account, Moses did not uh, fight back or he did not try to defend himself, but rather he allowed God to, to do the defense or to, to run his defense for him, right? He allowed God to do his will for him. Now, if you look at the, the process that, uh, that went through, Moses went through the entire few things. So, he trusts in the Lord. He was definitely someone who found joy in the work that he did. He committed his ways to the Lord, and then he waited on the Lord to execute his judge or execute his judgment. In that sense, and God indeed executed his judgment on Aaron and Miriam, and Miriam was afflicted with leprosy for about seven days, not mistaken, until uh, she was healed again. But I think the core principle that you want to look at from uh, from this on this part on, on why uh, God was so necessary to call Moses the meekest man on the earth at that point, is that he was swift to hear, so to speak, so to run. And this is also a very, very important part of being a meek person. The ability to control our thoughts and control our mouth and make sure that our thoughts and our mouth are, <laughs> are in sync. And a lot of times we are, we are the opposite, right? We are slow to hear, swift to speak, fast to run. Like we get burnt, we get agitated very easily. Someone comes and uh, and and uh, accuses us for something we know that we did no wrong for, that we, that, yeah, that we are totally innocent. Someone comes and and accuses you of, of of doing something wrong. Maybe you have executed your job very well, you executed this project very well. Everyone knows their, your your project very well. And then suddenly your colleague comes and hey, tell tell hey, I think you made a mistake here. I think this is wrong. What's for the first reaction? You defend yourself, right? You want to defend your work because you're proud in your work. You're proud in what you did. But in the Bible, in, the, in, this, in this account of Moses, this is not what God wants us to do. God is like, let your trust be your evidence. Let your trust in your work, trust in your, trust in your God, trust in your ability to do your work, be your evidence. And let the person in power, the person who is above you, come to your defense. And that's exactly what happened in the case of Moses. Moses knew he did no wrong. So he let he allowed God, or sorry, he was patient to let God be his uh be CEO in that sense, to be the person who, who executed judgment on his behalf on the people who were accusing him for wrongdoings. So in that sense, meekness is not argumentative or not, neither does it seek revenge. It does not want to prove, it's not eager to prove that they are right. You're not eager to prove that, you know, they are the brightest belt in the, in the room, which is oftentimes uh, what we are taught to, to, to be in this world. Uh, you have to be the brightest belt in the room. You have to be the, the, the fastest talker for you to, to be good at public speaking, to be a debate or to rise in the ranks. But the Bible is opposite. It tells us if you if you are confident in your ability, if you know that you're doing right in the God, the right in the Lord, if you have followed the, the five steps just now, the Lord will take care of you. Well then this is the a few steps that I prepared on how we can uh, be better and meeker people in the sight of the Lord. And just going on to the a few final verses. If we look at James the 1, verse 20, 21, 
the rod of man does not work out the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all fruitiness and overflowing of evil, receive in meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Once again, we are looking, you know, the contrast is being made. That this, the not, not the wrath of man that can work out righteousness of God. It's not in our wrath that, or not in, the, in our pride that we will be able to inherit the earth. It's in the meekness in which we receive the word. And the very first time in which we are exposed to the word, and at that point where we decide to be Christians, and, then, and as we live our lives from that point on as Christians, just receiving that word with the, with the same meek spirit that we have talked about, and then shall it be able to save our souls. So now let's just look very, very briefly on uh, what it means to by inheriting the earth. And after this, uh, we'll be closing for the night. So we'll just look at, looking at this, uh, this verse in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18 and 22. And here it reads, let no one deceive them himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, but it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are in vain. Therefore, let, not, let no one glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether it is Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, your life or death, or things present, all things to, or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God. So in the point of inheriting the earth, inheritance, what's an inheritance? Inheritance is something that's given to you by someone who owns it. So in that sense, who owns the earth? And that answer is obviously God because he created the earth. And when he's saying that you inherit the earth, that means you inherit everything that God is, has created. That God is here to give us the, his, his creation for us to use and for us to live as Christians, and for us to live as people who are wise. And we say this here, for all things are yours. Everything has been already been given to us. There's nothing that God has spared uh, when it comes to the earth, when it comes to the, the, the physical things that he has provided unto us. He has given us all things. And, his, and through his, his, uh, his son Jesus Christ, through the physical action of him dying on the cross, he's also given us the ability and the opportunity to seek and to become his children within these confines of the earth. So in this sense, we as, as, as meek people, people who understand that God is in control, will then, of course, inherit the earth. We will have an inheritance in everything that God wants to give us. And the, and the thing that God, and what God wants to give us are definitely not uh, the, the physical pleasures of the world. God says that a man is worthy of his wages, right? You work, you get what you reap. And that is the universal law of the land. Anybody who works will get what they are reap. And, and, it, and, it, and it works for everybody. But the, the defining feature here of what makes a, a Christian or what makes someone uh, a meek person who inherit, inherit, or that inherits uh, compared to someone of the world is that who do we attribute that wage to? Who do we attribute that uh, gift that God has given to us to? The world attributes it to themselves. But as a meek Christian, someone who is meek, we attribute that to God. So in the sense, everything is fair. The world is fair. God has created a fair world for all. But the, 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 the thing that makes us different, makes Christians different apart from the world, is who do we attribute that blessing to? Is it us? Is it our own devices? Or is it because we understand that it's through God's creation, God's uh, plan for us that we are able to be here in this world and to enjoy the blessings that he has given to us. So, bless the meek for nation charity. I hope uh, today's short lesson has been uh, somewhat beneficial to us all as a reminder of uh, how can we can be better and meeker people. Uh, I don't, don't consider myself a very meek person. Uh, it's not something that is easy for us to achieve, especially for us uh, living in a corporate world and, uh, and uh, working for people trying to be the best as they can. <laughs> uh, as the Pokemon song says, they want to be the very best that no one ever was. Not easy, but uh, I believe uh, uh, through, through the word, all things are possible. Through God, all things are possible. And as we live our lives, let's try to, each step, each step we take to uh, become 
uh, meeker people understanding and attributing our, our glory and attributing our successes to God, understanding that uh, it's not by our power alone that we are there in, our, in wherever position we are in, but also it's because we have chosen to believe and trust in the Lord that we have been called for a higher calling and we are called to bless and praise God to the positions that we've been put in. So yeah, if uh, that's what I prepared today. So if there's any contribution or, or comments or questions, uh, please feel free to do so. I'm not I'm not prepared any questions for discussion because uh, the, I, I really don't know what kind of question you can discuss over being meek because you know it's a not a topic that you become meek overnight, right? Yeah. But if anyone has any, anything they want to share, uh, yeah, please feel free, feel free to do so. I do not have a yeah. question. So I'm in sales, right? Yeah. So in sales, we need to sell ourselves. <laughs> is it possible to well, be meek while being a good salesman? Or I need to tell people, hey, I do this, I achieve this, all this. So is it still possible to be meek? It's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, I believe uh, in, the, in the... There's definitely a way for us to be meek in everything that we do. And it's a matter of... Uh, uh, who, I said everybody is given an equal opportunity to, to read from the blessings of the world. The question is then, who do we attribute that, that, uh, that blessings to? So as a salesman, of course, your job is to want to be number one salesman in the world, right? You want to, to sell the biggest house. You want to sell the most amount of, uh, of uh, goods in the world to your clients. The end then, who are we attributing this, the wealth that we gain from that to? Are we saying that it's all because of me? Is it because uh, it is my... Through my efforts alone, I have been able to achieve this. Or is it, am I also attributing that to God? I mean, it's God in the equation of my success. And like I said, if you commit, uh, wait, uh, point number three, commit your ways to the Lord. Are we, are we, are we running our, our, uh, our process of, of selling our goods or selling our ideas wherever we are selling to our clients in a way that God will approve? And if the answer is yes, that you believe truly believe that through your understanding of uh, of the word, to your, to your, your study the word that you are going through that process in a way that God will definitely approve of, doing what necessary, uh, giving back to the church, giving, doing your your due diligence, doing your still working in the uh, working for the Lord, and still and still maintaining that uh, that salesman streak, or we want to call it. But of course, we are still being. Uh, meek in the sight of the Lord. The question is, are, is the world able to see it? Or does the world look, see it? Uh, have to, uh, and you always have to, have to have a mirror, right? And the mirror can, can often not be ourselves or often not cannot be someone who is not working with us. If you ask, a, if you ask your, your, your colleague or you ask a friend that you just met, does, do they think that you are a meek person? Right? So in our success, in our wealth, do they think that we are a meek person? And sometimes you hear a lot of this, right? That, uh, if, uh, some people have right, rich friends and they go and, oh, that person was very humble. You know, I, I really didn't feel that I was in the presence of a rich person. So do we exude that kind of, uh, of, of uh, meekness, I guess, when we are in the presence while, while also still maintaining a, uh, a strong sense of self? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Uh, being meek, uh, is when somebody see you in action or they say you are meek. But to be meek, we must first have the right heart and the right mind. If we try to be meek and we are not right in our heart and mind, we have to control our thoughts is much harder. So I have many occasions where I try to be humble as you are in certain position. It's not easy at all. So it's easier said than done. So you want to try and think right, set your heart right with God. But when you're in the influence of so many others and sometimes people just backstab you, being human, you actually revert. If you're not strong in the way, yeah. you're not rooted, you actually revert and say, you know, and then your actions actually is against what you're trying to practice. Yeah. Not easy at all. Yeah, yeah. Easier said than done, I mean. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for sharing, Sir Wijing. You want to add uh, okay. Hello. Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear. Um, 
I think you have expanded a lot with regard to what it means to be meek, all right, the, the practical aspect of meekness. I, I want us to now uh, ask concerning, I want to ask concerning the inheriting of, and, and you rightly uh, refer us to Psalm 37. Um, you know, in Psalm 37, the Lord knows they of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. Okay, that is a, a reference in inheritance, uh, and, and it will last forever. But looking at the earth, right, uh, you know, the, the, the devil brought uh, Jesus up onto the high mountain and showed him the kingdom and the glory below and said, all this I can give to you if, if you fall down and worship me. And, and of course, uh, that is in reference to what is on earth. So I, I want to ask exactly what does the inheritance of the earth represent? Now, in Psalm 37, in verse uh, 9, right? Those who wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. In verse 11, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance. Of course, abundance is not earthly things, but the abundance of peace. And then further down in um, verse 22, uh, blessed is he who inherit the earth, referring to those who are righteous and show mercy. Yeah, and, and you go on again to uh, Psalm 37, right? Um, um, talking about verse 34 again. Those who wait upon the Lord, uh, he shall exalt them to inherit the land. Uh, so various verses talk about those who wait, those who are righteous, those who show mercy, those who are meek as inheriting the earth. Uh, so, so can you expand a little bit on what you think it means to inherit the earth? That was actually a very tricky question when I was actually preparing this lesson on what exactly it means to inherit the earth and what, how does that contrast with the, 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 the first lesson that we listened to, which is obtaining the kingdom of heaven. So there was, when Kai thought about uh, food and spirit, they asked of the kingdom of heaven. It had similar, almost similar uh, themes where talking about someone who is humble in spirit, and then they shall then be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And now, after two, one sentence later, or two sentences later, good, Jesus is talking about the meek and how then they shall then inherit the earth. So I believe that this happens after you have already inherited the, or the uh, once you have already entered into the kingdom of heaven. So if you look at Matthew 6, verse 33, and the entire seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. God is saying that if you seek his his uh his righteousness first, seek everything that we have that David is talking about here in uh, Psalm chapter 37, that you shall want for nothing. In that sense, the earth has provided to us everything that we already need without us needing to go and actively seek for it. So in that sense, God has provided us, as long as we are there to look for it, so as long as we open our eyes to it and we understand what God has provided for us, we have already inherited the blessings that God has provided upon this earth. And there's no need for us to be excessive in our wants for, for the, upon this mortal realm. So if you look at Matthew 6, verse 33, all these things shall be added to you. And talking about everything that the Gentiles seek for, the uh, what shall we eat, what shall we wear, what shall we, uh, where shall we sleep, and where shall we go the next day. These are the things that the, the, the world wants us to seek, right? The, the inheritance of the earth that the world has, has uh, given unto us. Like the, world, no, the, the world has taught us that we need, that we need to inherit all these things for us to live a good and peaceful life, a good and happy life. And also, and also look at the, the rich fool. His, he amassed riches, right? He amassed a lot of riches. Look at the, the rich man, Lazarus, also a very rich man. But the inheritance that God wanted to give them was not, that, was not of that inheritance that they have amassed, rather the inheritance that upon this earth, what they do with those riches. So the inheritance that God has given to us, that we, when we are meek, we inherit the earth. We inherit the calm and blessing, or the, the calm and spiritual understanding that we have already been given everything that we need in this life. That the earth is ours to be taken, 
the earth is the, the fields are plenty that everything is provided for us. We don't need to be excessive in what we do. We don't need to to try too hard to be what like what to get what God wants us to give. As long as we are there to receive the blessing, to understand that God has given to us the the community that we have here in the, in the church, right? We read in the Acts chapter two, and they went about and when no one had want. And that's such a beautiful thing that nobody had any want. Imagine that. I mean, I've not seen, I've not had a day in my life that I had no want, right? I think very few people can, of us can, can say that. But that was what the first country Christians did. And everyone wanted for nothing. That was, and that I believe the purest sense of what inheriting the earth is. When we are so humble, we are so meek, we understand God's path so well that all of us collectively are so happy in what we are doing that we are literally not wanting for anything else. We are literally not wanting anything else the world can give us other than the happiness and comfort that uh, God has provided unto us. That is a very powerful, that's a very tall order for us to achieve and it's not, not easy for us to achieve. But I believe that what it means, what it's meant by inheriting the earth. If anyone else has any uh, better answers, I'm welcome to, to, to share them. Oh, yes, Andy. That's the mic. Thanks very Jonah for the sharing as well and the uh, explanation. I have a different perspective on this verse. Um, and that comes from the, the actual Greek text mm -hmm. of, um, of what Jesus said. When he said, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. He was speaking, the context is he's speaking to Jewish people. And the word earth there, the Greek word, the Greek word is gen, which means uh, land, mm -hmm. not just earth as the physical earth as we know it, but land. And in, in the Jewish context, when they talk about inheriting uh, the land, it was, a, it was kind of a, a phrase that they used to denote abundance, mm -hmm. a lot of things. So when they say you inherit the land, it means you have a lot of blessings that God provides you too. And now, um, the other uh, context of the land that they use, and sometimes when Jesus uh, made, made, made reference to this land, he was also referring to uh, Canaan, right? The spiritual Canaan, not the, uh, I mean, Back in the day, the physical Canaan, which was the promised land, but during Jesus' time when he was speaking, of course, he was talking about the spiritual promised land, which was Canaan. And so that also um, referred to the land that he was saying. So he's saying, blessed are the meek. So if you're humble here on earth and you acknowledge the, the reverend, you, you acknowledge the power of God and you're reverend and you humble yourself before the Lord, you will inherit the spiritual Canaan land, right, uh, which is heaven. Um, and so I'm not sure, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, of course, if we are humble on earth and all that, you know, we, we will be blessed, of course, because we abide by God's law. But I think there's a, 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 a greater nuance here, which refers to um, spiritual inheritance, right? And when we look at the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the context also was Jesus was trying to give the Jewish people hope because they were persecuted, uh, they were uh, cast aside. And many of these people that he was speaking to were poor who had no standing in, in, in the world and they would never have. And so the hope that he was trying to give is don't place your hope here on earth. There is a better place, right? And so the, likely the context here refers mm. to that spiritual Canaan land as well. So I, that's the perspective that I take. And I think it ties back into when we humble ourselves before yeah. the Lord, we will inherit, um, you know, the, the, the Canaan land uh, yeah. or um, everlasting life. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. If I could also like add to that, I agree. Like I think I also have a different perspective about this verse as well, because um from what I understand from the word gentle, although it's also translated to meek, but it also comes from the idea, at least from what I understand, it is strength under control. So it's more of like the idea of allowing yourself to be subject under someone else's submission or being like someone else's authority, which is this. That's how I understand meekness. And when I draw that in parallel to the idea of inheriting your earth, uh, especially in the context of Moses, who was described as the person who was the most meek, um, there was one particular part, and uh, it was Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 25, where he talks about the blessing of obedience and the curse of disobedience. Mm. And he talks a lot, a lot like all the blessing, in a way quite similar to some of the amount, like blessed are those people, blessed are this, are blessed are this. And like curses are people who disobey, disobey. So it's very, very similar. And the, the the conclusion of the whole matter at the time was like, if you do all these things, you will inherit the promised land. So I think like for me also, I draw that kind of parallel where the, when it talks about inheriting the earth, is inheriting 
the promised land of heaven. So I mean, I, I agree. I mean, that's also the perspective yeah. that I have. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I thought it came to my mind that uh, when we put those things together, right, especially when you mentioned the Moses, although Moses was the weakest man of earth, he never inherited the promised land. Yeah, and, and, that, and that you can see, right, if you look at the other Beatitudes, that, and I believe Beatitudes come in, come in sequence, that only if you're pure in heart that you can see God. Uh, and I believe that you can't just be one of all these things, right? You have to be everything for you to actually uh, be able to reach that final destination. Yeah, so thank, thanks, uh, Nabel, for, for that sharing. Yeah, Kevin. Hello. I, I got this observation. I don't say perspective. God defines the word meek uh, through the life of Moses. Numbers 12, 3 mentioned that. Uh, if you look at Moses' life, the first 40 years of his life and second 40 years of his life, you don't see much of humbleness there. You don't see much of trust there, right? In fact, he, he, he argued with God whether he should be the right person to deliver the people out of Israel, I mean, out of Egypt. The last part of his life, the last 40 years of his life, probably shows the weakness that God want to, want to define or tell us. Uh, uh, that's why numbers, is written in numbers, right? And uh, the, way I, I, the way I look at it is that what, what gone through uh, life of Moses, when he was at the at the at the at the at the bank of the great river, I mean uh, the uh, the Gulf, right? He, he, when everyone was against him, he stayed his right to his cause and trust in God. And throughout all the journey, the forty years in the wilderness, when all are against him and everything goes wrong uh, against him, but he was stayed strong towards God. So I, I think what God is trying to tell us is that meekness is. To stay strong and to stay in the Lord, no matter what the circumstances is, all the all the challenges that you face, if you are stay on the right course and you trust in the Lord, you will inherit the the, the, the earth. Like what you mentioned, just now, the, the calmness, the peace that you will receive. So no matter what happened in your life, uh, if the things are go, going against you, but you stay strong and and to stay right, uh, I think that is the meaning of meekness that. God trying to tell us in the life of Moses, right? So you, you can see from the last part of his life, he is he's humble, he trusts in the Lord, but more than that, isn't it? The same meekness is not really humble, it's not really trust, but it's to stay right before God despite all the dis challenges that you face in life. And, and like, like what you say, uh, Moses did not inherit the Canaan land, but God did bring him to Mount Nebo and have a view of that land because God knew that, you know, give him the pleasure of seeing the land, even though he didn't have the chance to, to be there. Yeah, thanks everyone for the comments and questions. That was a very fruitful discussion. Uh, it's 9, 26, 27. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's time for us to close for the day. Well, and we have, shall have the closing prayer by for Nathaniel. Uh, please join me in prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, Lord, we come to now in prayer to give thanks for this opportunity that we can uh, spend our evening, this evening, to study another portion of your word. And we are also thankful, Lord, for your servant, Brother Jonah, who has put in the time, the effort, the end, the resources into preparing this lesson on Blessed are the Meek. We are grateful for his dedication in serving you and also his guidance throughout this lesson today. We pray a lot as listeners. We do not remain as, just as listeners, but also to be doers. We pray a lot that we will, be, we will do our best to apply what was shared today. And we pray a lot that you bless us with the strength to overcome our shortcomings and the strength to help us, Lord, to, to apply the lessons, the, the points. 
help us Lord to be more meek, to trust in you and to include you in our plans and to commit things that are approved by you. We pray a lot um, for the times that we have fallen short of your glory, for the times that we have failed to behave the way you want us to. We pray a lot that you forgive us and help us Lord to come back stronger. We pray a lot as we depart to our respective homes. We pray that you continue to bless us with uh, a safe journey back and also to be with us uh, till the next appointed hour. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, brethren. Um, some announcements before we are dismissed. Firstly, we thank uh, Chris for coming to join us again. Um, and then this Saturday, this Sunday, sorry, uh, please take note, um, the ladies, there is a ladies fellowship with Sister Rosita Han, um, 1.30 in the afternoon, right? And then this, uh, let's keep also Brother Andrew in prayers because he's going to Penang um, to preach on Sunday. Right, so we won't see him and the family. I think he's traveling a uh, few days uh, ahead of time. Uh, let's keep in prayers also uh, Brother Nathaniel's um, father, who was uh, discharged, and um, uh, that's a good sign that uh, he's made good progress after the surgery. Uh, let's continue to keep in prayers because I think um, uh, that's, that's just the beginning, right? So there will be things that he will need to go through and, and monitor also. Um, Sunday Bible class, let's look forward to a lesson by Brother Kevin. Baby Moses and uh, his early life, taken from Exodus 1 to Exodus 2. And then Brother Chanku is preaching on bear ye one another's burdens. So those are the announcements that I uh, have for this evening. Have a pleasant drive home and see you on Sunday.